young people did a great job tonight. We're thankful for you. Uh, it's not an easy thing to get started without a piano. And so uh, we appreciate that. I know you're a little bit um, stuck uh, there trying to find the right notes and start. The nice thing is you're not me because I usually do more looking for a note than I do finding it. I'm good at one thing. I can sing out. And uh, but that's about as far as I go. Open your Bibles tonight to the book of Philippians, chapter number four. <clears throat> um, I knew this would be a two-part sermon uh, when I prepared it, and we're excited to finish Philippians chapter four. It's good to have you all here. Uh, we have folks that are have traveled in, and you continue to pray for our ministry on Facebook, YouTube, and on our band app. And uh, we seem to have a lot of folks following us. We broke the 200 mark, and so I'm really excited about that. Our Facebook group is, all, is over or at 200 now, and so continue to invite people. We want to be a blessing. We want to see souls saved, and uh, that's why we've kept the radio on, and now God's given us the ability to reach the world. And I'm thankful for that. Uh, when I look on our YouTube um, statistics and all that, um, we find that we're having folks tune in and watch our videos from all over the world. One of our comments, uh, before I shut the comments off, was from Canada, and it was a good one. And a man from Canada talking about the blessing that the service was. And so please uh, continue to invite folks, and uh, we'll continue to work that way. Pray for us diligently. We need cameras and uh, computers set up uh, for the church. Um, and frankly, the hardest part about all that is knowing how to set it up. And we want to do what's right. We want to be a, want to be good stewards of the Lord's money. <coughs> Excuse me. And so, pray for us as we go through that, as we work toward that goal of uh, making everything a little more streamlined so we have a better connection than our phones can give us. But until then, um, uh, we're going to just keep on keeping on and doing the very best that we can. Philippians chapter 4, uh, this morning we said uh, we can stand and we can be, uh, we can support others and we can be steadfast. And next, we want to look at verses 7 and 11 in the book of Philippians, chapter number 4. And the peace of God, which passes us understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, I've just got to stop right here because I just thought of something. I never muted my phone. And so if some a knucklehead calls me during the message, we're just going to know that it's going to happen. And my phone is right there looking at me. And if you're on Facebook or band right now, and if you call me, I'm going to skin you. All right, back to the message. Uh, verse number seven again. Yes, verse number seven. And the peace of God, which passes understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now let's jump over to verse number 11. <clears throat> verse number 11, if I can get my Bible to turn. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. And so we see that there is a peace that God gives us that is beyond understanding. Yes. We have a dear friend um, whose son passed away. And I remember when my dad talked to this man, and this man said, well, my son died, and he was broken. It was a sudden thing, an accident, and it was a terrible, terrible tragedy. And my dad on the phone said, oh, brother, I, I can only tell you one thing. God will give you a peace that passes understanding. There are some times in our lives that that's all that gets us through is the peace that passes understanding. We don't rely on ourselves, on our intellect, or on others. We have to take everything and lay it at the feet of Christ. My sweet wife was talking about her friend who passed away of cancer. I couldn't help her. Isn't that a terrible feeling? When you 
have someone you love so dearly, and with your hands you can do nothing. Oh, with cancer, it doesn't matter how, how strong, how buff you are. It doesn't matter how smart you are. With some of these things in our lives, with some of these heartaches and these tragedies, nothing fixes it. But then Jesus comes. Amen. And he gives you that peace that passes understanding. I think of that old boy. Uh, come up here, Asa. Now I want you to lay on the floor, son. Just lay down there. You fall asleep during my sermon, son, I will poke you. Uh, over there is a big pool, and the man by the pool of Bethesda, and he's laying. Boy, you are one lame duck. And so he's laying there, and he's laying. He can't get to the water. And when the angel would stir the waters, everybody jumped in. And the first one in got healed. Jesus came, walked him by, and told this pathetic, sad state of a person. That hurt your feelings? It was meant to. He saw this, this poor fella, and he looked at him. And, and frankly, all joking aside, it was kind of sad and pathetic. Not, not pathetic in the wrong sense of the word, but you, where you would just pity a person. Your heart would hurt for them. And I'm thankful that Jesus is acquainted with our griefs and our pains. And he looked at this man and he said, well, thou be made whole. And he came up with all the excuses why he couldn't. He came up with all the reasons why he couldn't. He came up with... Uh, reasons that his friends did not love him enough to push him in the pool. But that wasn't Jesus' question. See, Jesus came to make you whole. You just have to accept it. You can go sit down. Amen. And that lame man said, yes, I want to be made whole. And Jesus healed him. There are times that we have to be totally settled in the grace of God. We, we heard songs about it tonight. The grace of God and the peace of God that passes all understanding. Someone said, prove God. And I said, I can't. They said, well, uh, if you can prove God, then maybe I'll accept him. I said, well, I can't prove God. It is by faith. And I've experienced his grace. Amen. Not a feeling. I mean, if you want a feeling, you can um, put a, a square battery to your tongue, and that'll give you a feeling. Oh, that's that's all I'm talking about. Holy Spirit cleansed me and made me whole. Now, when I sin, I'm convicted. It's not a feeling other than a feeling of of guilt and convicting power of the Holy Spirit, where He deals with my heart. I'm settled, though. I'm kept. Kept in salvation, but also we're going to look at some other things. So we see in salvation where uh, his purpose, his plan, and his people. Oh, God keeps us. He keeps us. And the Bible says there's no man that can take you or pluck you from the Father's hand. Isn't that wonderful? No one can ever Amen. remove you from the grace and power of God. They cannot remove his blood atonement from you. Not only are we settled and kept in salvation, but I want you to turn. Well, yes, go ahead and turn to 1 Kings chapter 8 and 6 through 13. This is a wonderful passage of scripture. It's a passage of scripture about Solomon, and we're going to take a few minutes here <clears throat> because uh, it's just a wonderful uh, place to stop and um, learn some very interesting truths. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 6 through 13. And the priest brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord unto his place. I like that, unto his place. Into the oracle of the house, to the most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread forth their two wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubims covered the ark and the staves thereof above. And they drew out the staves that, that the ends of the staves were seen out in the holy place before the oracle, and they were not seen without, and there they are unto this day. 
There was nothing in the ark save two tablets of stone, which Moses put there at Horeb, excuse me, when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel, when they came out of the land of Egypt, and it came to pass, when the priests were come out of the holy place, the cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Then spake Solomon, the Lord said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. I have surely built thee a house to dwell in, a settled place for thee to abide forever. Now, we don't worship at the temple today, do we? Solomon builds the temple. David is told you can't build the temple. You're a warrior. You're not going to be allowed. And so Solomon builds the temple. When we think about the temple, now we don't worship there today. So what is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Our mouths. The temple. Some of our temples are a lot bigger than others, and some are a lot slitterer than others, but nonetheless, we are all temples of the Holy Ghost. Now, when we think about a few words in this, it, it stirs me because there is a parallel here that I can see. Let's drop down to verse number 11, or verse number uh, 12, excuse me. Then spake Solomon, the Lord said that he would dwell in thick darkness. I have surely built thee a house to dwell in. A what place? A settled place for thee to abide forever. I'm so thankful that I settled the old account long ago. Amen. I went to the Lord, and, and it's, it's like we've heard Dr. Uh, Riker say many times that uh, old Bill did his part, and God did his. I want you to know you have no part except presenting a sinner, Amen. trusting a Savior. That's it. Coming out to God as a penitent sinner, asking for forgiveness. Placing your faith and trust in him. God does all the saving. It's Amen. not by works. Lest any man should boast. In fact the Bible says. That your righteousness is as. Filthy rags. It's just filth. And that's the very best you can do. And I look at this passage of scripture. The cloud filled. The house of the Lord. I look at that and I think about my life. Being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now we think about that. There's an indwelling when we get saved. We receive Jesus Christ first the Lord and Savior. The Holy Spirit comes to indwell us. His convicting power is there. But there is a, there are many fillings. There are many fillings of the Holy Spirit. When we will come and we say, Lord, I have sinned against you. I need to get right with you. And we put sin aside and let the Lord move 100% throughout our lives so that the priest could not stand and minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. Now I'll ask you, is that the way you live today? Is that the way I live? Is it so settled that my body is the temple of God that I live in a place that the Holy Spirit has full movement in my life. We pray when the Lord lays it on our heart. I'll wake up, and Miss Lesher and I talk many times, wake up in the middle of the night, don't know why, so we start praying, and God grips our hearts and starts laying somebody on our heart, and continually, it's settled, settled salvation, a settled temple, <laughs> And then we look, and we can also be sacrificial. We can be settled, yes, but we can be sacrificial. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 15 and 16. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Let me read that again. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise 
to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. We have too many silent Christians. We ought to be ready to testify. We ought to uh, have that sacrificial mouth where we sacrifice what we want to say and replace what we want to say sometimes in the flesh with what God has commanded us to say. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the, uh, the Lord say so. Let the redeemed say so. There are so few Christians now that say so. They go throughout their life. They don't tell others about Christ. They don't share testimonies. When God does something in your life, why would you hold back his praises? Oh, he opens doors all the time. He shuts doors. We see his hand move. Amen. And we thank him every day. So we see that there should be sacrificial praise. Verse 16 says this, but to do good and to com communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased the sacrifice of your mouth the sacrifice of your speech i know we dealt with the tongue this morning but oh it is such an unruly evil it is a fire that is hard to quench it is the rudder of a boat it will run a boat ashore aground it will destroy a life i used to do an illustration in fact uh, vera i think no, it wasn't Vera. Um, I can't remember the little girl that was there. It was way too long ago for it to be Vera. And uh, I, I did an illustration about a threefold cord, and we would take the rope, and I know I've used this illustration before, and we'd light it on fire and you know show that the threefold cord's not easily broken, but it's quickly burned, and the tongue is a flame of fire. And it's a destroyer. Oh, it can be good. It can warm. It can cook. It can save lives. But it can also take lives. And so to illustrate this, I said, you know, uh, we talked about the three-fold cord. And then in the next message, I used a fogger and I pushed it on. I said, let's pretend there's a fire. And I pushed down that fogger and the fog fills the room. And I said, now, a fire you can put out. If it's a candle, you pull water on it, fire's out. But I want one of you to get up and get rid of the smoke. What? Get rid of the smoke. Well, we can. They could use books and everything else trying to get rid of the smoke. And the illustration lies here. When you say something that is not of praise, that is not a good report, you can put that fire out, but you cannot clear the smoke. And I've seen so many marriages that, are, that have, have suffered because of this. A husband will say, I'm sorry. Okay. But the smoke's still in the air. Oh, I can forgive you. But Brother Steve, we're not quick at forgiving, are we? At least I'm not. And our wives are worse. No, I'm joking. My wife and I got in a little bit of a tip, mainly her, you know, tonight before we came in. She was talking about a dream she had, and then she was talking about, oh, no, don't you do this. I know this. I know what you're talking about. Oh, she was talking about the kids and this and that, and she gets quiet. Well, nice talking to you. Something to that effect. I said, what do you mean? I said, it's nice talking to you, too. You didn't even respond. I said, you didn't even ask a question. Right? Amen, fellas? Anybody? Not one person going to go to bat for me. Not one married man has the courage to say, you got it. I've been there. Thank you, Ron. The only courageous man in here. The rest of you ought to be ashamed. Hey, I kind of figure if you, Jason, if, if they want to reply, they ask a question. Doesn't that make sense? Yeah, see, that smoke's not going to clear, son. <laughs> you done fogged up the house. My wife said, that's why it's called a conversation. I said, you're right. I failed. 
And so I walked over, I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. And she busts some candies. She's trying to catch up with Heather. She's busting candies. I said, no, really, I'm sorry. Let's talk about it. It's a little late now. You know what it, I tried to put out the fire, but the smoke was still there, so her. Now she forgave me and she's a good woman and it's all over. If it's not, it is now or it's worse. And, <laughs> but we, ought, we have to sacrifice our tub. But beyond one another, and we got back on that because it's so important, but our praises to God. Are you a really, are you really a thankful person? And do you say it? Uh, we, we stood at that death camp this year, and those folks carved out a hole on their mask, and they got a little plastic piece so they can read lips. And at this death camp, you, you see the deaf watching those little screens, which seems like a great idea. Next time you want to complain about a mask, think that this is your ears. You know, this is how you're hearing them. And if you can't see their lips, you can't read them. And this poor lady's trying to talk, and there's a fog as she talks from the mist from her mouth over that plastic screen, and people couldn't read her lips because they couldn't see through the fog. Unfortunately, sometimes we are so fogged with the events and the things of this world that we forget to praise the Lord. We ought to be continually lifting up our voice to God Thanking him, thanking him for our salvation, and thanking him for what he's done for us on a daily basis. Praise to God. We can be sacrificial to those who carry the gospel. And we talked a little bit about missions today, but I want to go back to Brother Mueller. You remember we talked about him and the baker came. God laid you on my heart last night. Two in the morning I got up, made the bread, and we talked about the little boys and girls feeding the bread. Then, <laughs> got the milk, man. Car broke down. Too much milk for me to move. Either dump it out or give it to the children. Brother Mueller takes it. I don't, we think of God's blessing and Brother Mueller's faith, right? But stop. Let's look at a baker and a milk man. Which one do you want to be? You ever think about that? I've heard that illustration so many times. Which are you going to be? Are you going to be the milk man or the baker? Let's look at this. Milk man's going along. For his convenience, he will feed the hungry. He didn't stop to help. He didn't pray for these children. He didn't do any of that, but God said, they need milk, you're broke down. I look at the milkman as his deed was nothing more than selfish. You can disagree, and that's okay. I can be totally wrong. I broke down, and the only way I can fix a cart is to get rid of the milk. You can have it. I don't know any money to pay for it anyway. But here, I don't want to be that type of Christian. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? I want to give with that joyful heart. I want to be the guy that's laying in bed. We had a missionary called them honk shoes. And I said, time to make some honk shoes. I said, honk shoes? The shoes that honk when you walk like a clown? And he said, no, you know, and I was like, okay. And so I'd like to be that baker that, that's laying there making honk shoes. And, and all of a sudden, I wake up. And my first thought is to sacrifice for others. Is that a holy thing? Oh, yes, it's a holy thing. Because that's the example our Heavenly Father said. We know that Jesus never would have gambled. People ask me all the time, what's wrong with gambling? I said, well, well, there's a lot of scriptures we can use. But I want you to know Jesus wouldn't do it. Why? Because it wouldn't be a gamble. He'd always lose. Why? Because that's the way he lived his life. He came and he just gave. He would never roll the dice and he'd lose. 
you would always win in G at Jesus' expense. I want to be that type of Christian that when people come to me, that they know that I'll, I might not have silver and gold, but I'll give my prayer, I'll give my time, I'll give my care, and I won't turn my back. We ought to be that baker, the broken wagon, an obligated sacrifice. But the hot oven was a willing sacrifice. Is that the way you give? Well, I've got to do this. I've got to. My goodness, we had 19, I believe, at the, uh, <clears throat> at the work day, at the cleaning day the other day. Now, watch these men and women, boys and girls. We had a little fella out here. And we got one of those big blue mops. You know, I'm not talking about the little sponge thing that's a joke of a mop. I'm talking about the big, hefty mop. And here comes Stephanie and Ella carrying this mop bucket out and dumping it. Well, it's too heavy to dump, so you just push it off to the side and let it fall over. It's mixed on it. That's why. Stephanie says, see this entryway? Ella mopped it, five years old. I looked at Ella, her pastor, and said, oh, Ella, I'm so proud of you. And Ella did this. Oh, Ella, you're a hard worker. Next thing she did, she mopped the kitchen. Did she mop the kitchen? She mopped something else. Well, I don't remember where she was mopping. She was mopping again. And then she came up and she said, Pastor, what about this ping pong table? It looks like it needs wiped down. Some little boys were over playing foosball. I won't mention any names. <laughs> Wipe this down. You know why? She wanted to please her pastor. I want to have that heart with my Lord and Savior. Lord, will you open another door? Lord, will you give me another opportunity? Because there's nothing I wouldn't sacrifice for you, Lord. I will give you my heart. I will give you my time. I will go 100%. No regrets. No turning back. Father, you have all of me. Brother Miller gets up here with that sacrifice. All of me. Brother Donnie works on the sound desk. All of me. Brother Andy playing a guitar with a mask on. All of me. Lydia up here playing the violin. Bought a new violin for the church service. She doesn't play it at all. It's an electric violin. She can't I mean, she's got a little box thing at home. There's no reason to have it at home. Most of our, most of our musicians leave their instruments here. Do you know why? Because with the flute, all of me. With the saxophone, all of me. Little Noah got up here, and uh, these kids don't even know what PowerPoint is. Asa gets up here, doesn't even have a clue what PowerPoint is. Did you notice he was scared? Son, you were scared, weren't you? Yeah. You did a good job. All of me. All of me. So we can be sacrificial to the gospel, to those who carry the gospel, and then to those in need, but not in judgment. This is a very tricky place. It's hard to know when people are in need. We have a lot of knocks on the door and doorbells. And we would like to give to everyone that came by that had a financial need. The number one thing is very difficult for a church because there are a lot of liars out there. That's right. It's very difficult to know if somebody's lying to you. We've given money to somebody and even given it to where they owed a debt, and the people who they owed a debt to gave the money back to them as a refund. It's so difficult. We gave money to a fellow. He said, my grandmother's dying, or a girl, grandmother's dying in Bloomington Hospital. I just want to get there before she dies. And I need gas money, so 
went down and got gas, and I happened to be going to Walmart too, and went to Walmart and got gas, went out to the highway and turned left. Went that way to go to Bloomington. I bet she didn't make it to Grandma's. It's hard. But we can't become cynical. We can't become hard with our finances. We ought to be able to give and give what we can. I think it's funny, I continually get letters from Donald Trump asking me for financial support. <laughs> I just find that really humorous. Trump Tower, and I get a letter. Donald Trump needs your support. I open it up and said, fill out the survey of what you think. I love filling out those, that's my voice. And then it said, now send the survey back for $45. I'm like, oh, man, no. Um, but people need help. Well, it's uh, Psalm, Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says this, But God commended his love toward us, and now while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. God, our Lord Jesus Christ, gave us the supreme sacrifice. He sacrificed himself. Greater than love hath no man than this, and a man lay down his life for his friends. Today we're so wrapped up in people taking lives. Oh, we ought to be willing to sacrifice for others. And then in John 15, no, or 15, 12, it says this. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Folks, we ought to be able to go. I, I've had opportunities to help some of you. That some, I'm not much of a construction guy. But I can paint. I kind of like painting. And I got a pair of painting britches, cargo pants, and I'll put them on to go paint somebody's house because I don't like painting my own house. I'll paint somebody else's, and I look at those, and I say, yep, this is so-and-so's room I painted, and this was their house. And this was, you know, we ought to have that attitude of sacrifice, and I, I just want to help the brethren, help those that have a need. And we can't be surrendered. And verse number 12 of chapter 4, it says this, I know both how to be abased, I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. We ought to be able to surrender everything for the cause of Christ. We watch missionaries and we expect it out of them. But what about in my life? Lord, I need to be sacrificed. I need to be not just sacrificed, but I need to surrender that wherever you would send me, I would be willing to go. And uh, there is a video that I've desperately been looking for. A little missionary girl and her husband were going overseas. I believe it was Tibet. And this girl was sitting there with her husband, and her husband goes, I, I believe God's called us to the t Tibet. I want you to pray about it. And she said, as a testimony, she said, Lord, I don't want to go to Tibet. He said, but I'll go with you. And he gave her a scripture. But Lord, what about my children? And the Lord gave her a scripture verse. But Lord, what about this? And every time she came up with a question to God, he always gave her a verse because she hid it in her heart. And she surrendered. And she said these words, if we die serving the Lord, it'd be worth it. Little did she know they got in a plane. And as they were flying to their mission field, Coming home, coming back after a furlough, the plane's altimeter or whatever that is was not right, and they flew into the side of a mountain. And she was gone. But you have to understand it wasn't her life. She had already given it to the Lord, and she said, Lord, whatever you want, I totally surrender. A beautiful part of that story. The plane was just a complete loss. I mean, <clears throat> there was nothing that they could really salvage. But then they went by and they found something. It was about this size. It's 
or of the Bible. Not marred, not scarred, not burned. Lay it there. You know, even in those times of trial and even in those times of death, we still know that our Heavenly Father is with us and I can be surrendered. Why? Philippians 4.13 I can do all things through Christ Amen. which strengthens me. Now I want to go back to all these points. I can. Yeah, I can. Why? I can stand because my strength is through Christ. I can support others. I can support the work because I get my strength through Christ. I can be steadfast because my strength is through Christ. I can be settled. I can be kept because the strength, the keeping strength is through Christ. I can be sacrificial because my Lord was sacrificial and I can do it through Christ and his strength. I can be surrendered only through Christ and I can be strong because it's not my strength it's his with heads bowed and eyes closed tonight wrapping up the first part of Philippians chapter